Well, good morning. <clears throat> you know, when I say bowl, what comes to mind? <laughs> hey, that's exactly what I was going to say. You know, a nice big warm of bowl of chili. I heard we have chili today. Uh, you know, oh, that's what I'm talking about. You know, about half an hour, half an hour. Uh, we're going to be, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And today is... Uh, the Super Bowl, isn't it, today? You know, I got, yeah, woo! Got my hat. I got my colors. <laughs> I know the Bible has some bowls in it as well and when you get to Revelations, but these bowls aren't, aren't all that positive. Uh, you don't want to participate in these bowls. Um, in the, if you turn to Revelation 16, 17, the last bowl is described here, and it's, it follows after six other bowls. It's the seventh bowl that the angels pull out, pour out. Um, reading from the 17th verse, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done! Then there came flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. That's the fireworks show. <laughs> yeah, uh, today they're going to play Super Bowl 50 with all its hype. It must have, you know, this was, this was after, the first Super Bowl was after I was born. Whoa. Uh, you know, well, there will probably be a Super Bowl 51. And then the Panthers will be a forgotten memory. <laughs> no one will ever forget the winner of the final bowl. You know, God is going to give his best fireworks show ever. And I mean, the biggest earthquake in, in the history of this world since man has been on this world. And lightning, peals of thunder. I mean, that's going to be a fireworks show. You know, it's like that ball is already headed down the bowling alley. And the 10th frame, 12th ball. Uh, perfect game. The 12th strike. You know, a lot of things come to mind when I hear of bowl. I was looking at the new retractable roof they plan on putting on the stadium of the Cowboys play in. There you go. <laughs> you know, this bowl is not something to be proud of. But you know, the Cowboys, they, they used to be more popular than the Broncos. They've got five, five rings, five Super Bowls won. That, that's, that's over a tenth of the Super Bowls that they've won. You know, this world is pretty popular. But the last bowl will be played and poured out one day. And when that final flush happens, <clears throat> heaven and earth will pass away. But God's word, God's kingdom, and God's glory will last forever. Please, let's turn to Luke 9, 26. Broncos are playing in the Super Bowl today. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think they're the underdog in most polls, but I like rooting for the underdog, especially when I know the underdog is going to win. We win. You know, not, not some Super Bowl championship, or, but a war to end all wars. Eventually, God's going to take all the junk and rebellion that Satan, the flesh in this world, seems to be stacking in this bowl, and he's going to, and he's going to pour it out on this world. And 
all those things that the, this world has tried to pin on him. You know, I've, I've tried to pin things on God before. You know, God's your fault. But all that stuff is going to be poured out, bowl full after bowl full, until that final bowl. You know, God's patiently waiting to pull that flesh lever. Thank God. Until sin has reached its full measure. You know, Jesus died on the cross and rose to have victory over death. You know, even with that huge victory underneath his belt, many have forgotten. Many in this world even ridicule those that, that try to shame those and, and shame those that, that still entrust their lives to Jesus. And, and by faith, expect a future final Super Bowl or a cosmic battle of good and evil that God's going to win. And you still believe that? Yeah. I do. You know, we reminded last week that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. You know, every once in a while, God unveils his championship ring to show us that he is the champion and always will be. And that his kingdom is authentic. Out of Luke 9, starting with verse 26. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth. Some who are still standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up to the mountain, went up onto a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They, they spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to the fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they came and became fully awake, they saw his glory. And two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped, enveloped them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. Now this, this awesome event happens to Peter, John, and James, you know, as they, they climb up the mountain. You know, and they're almost too groggy to soak it in. You know, it's, it seems that, that when Jesus starts praying, it seems like that these three in particular start sleeping. You know, oh, it's time to close their eyes and pray. Okay, Jesus, go on. You know, say your prayer. You know, I'm with you. I'm with you. And then all of a sudden, you know, I don't know, their eyes must be closed, but something must have penetrated their eyelids. It was so bright. That bright light just started shining there. And it's like, whoa, something's happening. You know, oh, there's Jesus, you know. Whoa, look at that guy. I mean, his, his, his face has changed and, and his clothes are brighter than lightning. Wow. So this is what Jesus was talking about. You know, the disciples saying to each other, when, when Jesus said, you know, before you die or before you leave this earth, well, there's some people standing here that will see and taste the kingdom of heaven. You know, there it is, Jesus, it's time to go. Let's go, guys. Jesus is going to walk down that mountain. He's going to claim his kingdom. Yeah. But... Uh, Jesus didn't walk down that mountain all shiny, but the cloud enveloped them and said, this is my son. Listen to him. 
You know, Jesus unveils his glory and a taste of his kingdom. You know, the brightness may have stunned Peter's already sleepy senses as he tries to capture the moment by setting up three shelters for each of them. But let's, let's turn to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. You know, I remember as a kid, we did a lot of welding on the dairy. And you know, uh, kids, you know, you like to look at those things. You know, wow, what's happening? And, and I was told time and time again, don't look at that light. It's going to blind you. You know, that little half centimeter square of light was brighter than lightning. <laughs> Seemed like it. And I couldn't look at that because it's going to destroy my eyes. You know, and, I, and I, I try to, you know, peek or once in a while, I know, and I could still see, uh, luckily. <laughs> um, but the disciples described Jesus as a bright as a flash of lightning. This wasn't just his face. It was his clothes as well. This was a peek at the kingdom Jesus was talking about. Now, this isn't the only time the glory of God appeared. Moses, way back when, when he's receiving the law, you know, he's with Jesus on the mountain in Elijah. But, but long before Moses saw that glory with those disciples, he saw God's glory when, he's, when he was getting the, getting the law. And when Moses is getting the law, and he's going in the presence of God, and then he goes to the presence of the people, his face was so bright that the people said, Hey, you know, we can't look at your face. And he had to put a veil on his face. You know, that was bright. Can you imagine, you know, looking at somebody that, that's face is as bright as the sun and trying to listen to him preach? So Moses puts a veil over his face, and then he talked with God, and then he returned and put a veil over his face, and his face just retained some of God's glory. Moses' face that glowed from the presence of God faded. Moses represented the law in the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was a veiled Christ. It was the kingdom veiled. In 2 Corinthians 3, starting with verse 7, now, if the ministry that brought death, which is the ministry of the law, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. <clears throat> We're not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, that same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed. Because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with an ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We're bringing out the glory of God through our faces, unveiled you know, I, I said earlier that Jesus from time to time unveils his championship ring. I win, he says. And this is one of them, you know, he's on the mountain. But, with Peter, James, and John, when they prayed, he was transfigured. With Moses, God's glory was reflected from his face that was veiled. I mean, this is God displaying his glory. Paul talks of a better glory. 
A better unveiling that is not just a mere foretaste or a peek at this kingdom. It is the reality of this kingdom. It's the reality of this kingdom. You know, wait a sec. Now, I, I thought the kingdom wouldn't happen until that final bowl gets poured out and, and then the, the books are opened and, and those that are written in the book of life, they go to heaven and those whose names were not found in the book of life, they're, they're going to go thrown into the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. You know, that's, that's, that's when that final score gets posted. Please, let's turn to 2 Peter 1.10. Jesus told his disciples that they would see the kingdom. The kingdom already existed. They saw the kingdom. So when Paul talks of this kingdom that can be viewed with unveiled faces, what was he getting at? What was he getting at? How, how do we see the kingdom? You know, when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And Jesus said the kingdom, he said, the kingdom is within you. And Paul expounds on this to say that we as believers reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. You know, the veiled glory was written on tablets of stone to show God's glory veiled as an outward guideline. That was on the outside. The unveiled glory is written in the heart as an inward new desire to be like Jesus through the work of the Spirit. That's the kingdom. The kingdom is within you. And it just needs to be unveiled through Jesus Christ. You know, we don't have to climb up some mountain of, of God and, and, and then, you know, after we're all tired from the big hike, you know, and, and then we pray and we fall asleep and then all of a sudden there's the glory of God. We don't got to pray like that. It's right here. The glory of God, the kingdom of God is right here inside of you. It's waiting to be unveiled or, or maybe it's already reflecting out through our lives, you know, with unveiled faces, you know, that, that people see Jesus in you. Now that's glory. That's glory. Brighter than the sun. Second uh, Peter 1 verse 10. Therefore, my brothers... Be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things. Even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it. As to a light shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. For the 
dawning what, what's that song <laughs> dawning to the norm <laughs> till the noonday bright and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth the kingdom of love and light is that kingdom in you is that reflection of Jesus ever increasing in your lives it is. It is. You know, we have a more certain proof than what these people saw happen as God's glory and voice proclaimed the kingdom of God. That proof is not on the outside as an observation. Oh, there it is. It's an inward experience. There it is. I know. I, I, I saw the ring. We win. It's not some super event in the past or in the future. It's an existing event happening daily. And that proof of the kingdom is that light shining in a dark place. That, that proof is in your hearts. And that proof is to increase more and more. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you today. And Lord, it's, it's, it's great to see things and activities like the Super Bowl. And, and even the display of your kingdom like, like those disciples did on, on that mountain and as the Israelites did as they saw the glory of Moses. But what's more special than that is the glory that has come into our hearts, that has been unveiled through Jesus Christ, your Son, in our hearts. And Lord, I just pray that, that you will unveil this glory in more and more people. And Lord, as we come to you, Lord, unveil yourself in us that we may re reflect your glory to those around us uh, and display your kingdom. A kingdom that is within us. The kingdom that will last forever. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.